We're speaking with Rabbi Leib Trapper. Rabbi Leib, you were named after a remarkable person, your grandfather, Rabbi Leib Foyer, as it's all known as a, he was an Elu, a genius, and he was a Rav in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Can you tell us how and what his, his name represented in terms of your being named after him and who this great personality that we would like to know more about was all about? I always was, actually sometimes I was uh, agonizing over the fact that how could such a great genius and a Talmud Chacham that Rabbi Yosheb Be Salavechik from Yitzhak Khan and told me he was the second greatest head in America. I asked him where the first was, of course you mentioned his father, but um, the second greatest head in, 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 in America, to the point, to the point that I spoke to Rabbi Yosheb Salavechik in Chicago once and he told me that when Rabbi Yosheb Be would take a rest in the weekday, sometimes rest for an hour or so, he would tell us, I'm not taking any calls except for a blade for, if he calls me, please wake me up. Um, Blayfor was was a Lithuanian through and through. He was Litvak. He was the last, the last two, the, one of the last two Talmidim of Reb Chaim Salvechik in Brisk. Not, I'm sorry, in Volozhin. Volozhin before Reb Chaim went to Brisk. Him and the Mechit to Ilui. They learned Becharusa. The Mechit to Ilui was a Rebbe in YU. My grandfather was not a Rebbe in YU. He was there one day or visiting, but and he was very much of an Ish MS, and to a fault. And he paid a price for that. And um, in the derech of his Rebbe, every word counted to be precise. Every word meant something. Precision was very important. Rebbe Leifar, of course, like I mentioned to you, was his wife that he married from the Geffen family was a granddaughter, a great-granddaughter to Rebbe Kivega's close friend, Ramosha Kharif, they called him. My grandmother, Allah Shalom, her name was Musha, which was really a kind of turning of Moshe into Moshe and um, she would always say uh, you know who I'm named after you know like she'd be proud of the name that she was a great granddaughter of Moshe Kharif and that's by the way the relationship people talk about Moshe Kharif who's also a great grandson of Moshe of, uh, Kharif and in any event so my grandfather came to America I think in the 20s and he was really penniless and um, he had Almost became a rabbi. He wanted to become a rabbi in in, uh, in um, we went to what's that city right next to uh, Holyoke, uh, Springfield. Springfield. He wanted to become a rabbi in Springfield, right? And he ended up getting the job in Holyoke for whatever reason. And they paid him like uh, twelve dollars a month, and it was like really torture. And the next rabbi came after him. They paid fifty dollars a month, like a big jump. It was an amazing thing. But he really took the job, and he was lonely, very lonely, and no one to learn with him. Tyre was his only thing that was his I'm going to fast forward a little bit and tell you how much Tyre meant to him when he was when he was deathly ill and he had stomach cancer Dr. Jaffe told me that he went was his private physician came to him and told him he says um, you think it's worth living through all this pain he said Dr. Jaffe if I could have one thought of Tyre it's worth all the Yisurim in the world that's how much his love for Tyra was. He suffered a lot to, that I don't know about, but he was respected by all the G'dalim, and he stayed out of every hair of politics that was even close to dark green or dark black brown or dark, just dark. He, anything was clear white, it was fine, but it was just started turning colors. He just didn't get involved. He, in fact, he was once at, at one famous organization, religious organization meeting, they invited him to come. He came all the way from Holyoke to New York City in the Lower East Side to go into this meeting. And after 15 minutes, Baron Cutler was there, and Big Adelum was there. After 10 minutes in the meeting, he said, excuse me, this is not totally this politics, and he walked out. <laughs> he just walked out of the room, and, and he never, never came back again. His genius mind was um, had a lot of humor to it as well. He was on the train once with the Mechit to Ilui, the genius of Mechit. He was on the train because he, he went to YU give a shir one time, and and he was there to make the train, take the train back to his visit to my father, whatever it was. And my grandfather saw a Chinese newspaper on the, on the, on the subway. So he picked it up and he started reading it. So the major just says to him, uh, tell me, I, I don't understand. Do, you, do you, read, you read Chinese? He says, no, 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 I don't, I don't know Chinese. He says, so why are you reading this paper? So he said to him, look, he said, I'll translate Yiddish and say it back to you, and I'll, I'll, I'll translate it in English. He said, Hetzachayim. Shlame, he called him. Hetzachayim. 
was a state, a saibi nisht emes. Whatever it says is not true anyway. It's mission the surahs, between the lines, all the same. <laughs> so why can I read it? <laughs> so he read between the lines. <laughs> between the lines, the top of the lines, just, this was all not, Tim was an Irish guy, so he didn't really read it. So he picked it up and was looking at perusing it for a few seconds. But the point was that his creative mind was able to come up with an answer on the spot, like what it meant, what news meant to him, and how he had viewed his clarity. It was clarity, it was clear. That news is all shekher, it's lies, it's propaganda, it's, you know, but. And he had three children, he had actually five children, two sons that died before their bar mitzvah. Of di- with diabetics that died before the mitzvah, Binyamin, I think everyone was parrots, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm thinking. And then he had uh, three daughters. My mother was one of them, um, the youngest one, and then he was one older than my mother, who married a great guy by the name of Baruch Leib Sassoon, which is in Manhattan, and he was learned in the mirror. In fact, um, he came to the mirror yeshiva to pick out a son in law. And, he, you know, people. I don't know if this is part of his genius or part of his, his love of Torah. Whichever way it is, it was just fascinating. He'd walk in, people told me he walked into the yeshiva, go to a person who was learning. He wouldn't say, Shalom Lecha, Mam Leib Fora, what's your name? He'd say, What's your name? Like, like, what, what, what's where? That's how he met my, my uncle, Baruch Leib. What's your name? What's your name? So once I spoke to Rav Shach, because Rav Shach was born in Babalnik, and Rav Shach knew my grandfather, and in fact he said he had somewhere. Put away, which I never, I never got. Two tetamei rabbanim that he wrote, and chubis that he had from him also, which he, which was somehow he lost it, whatever it was, it was got lost, misplaced. Dis- are there any sforum that remain, or any chubis? Yeah, there are chubis that were printed. Rav Gifta had had a lot more than he even had. A lot more left besides what he printed. Rav Gifta, but because he's very close to Rav Gifta, it was because there's like a little bit of a talmud of my grandfather, and um, so I was mentioning that. Um, you know, Rabbi Yeshebeh had a tremendous derech eretz, always with Rabbi Farah was him. In fact, I have a letter from Rabbi Yeshebeh, from Rabbi Yeshebeh, Rabbi Yeshebeh, the father of Rabbi Yeshebeh, to my grandfather, who had a little job in, 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 in Holyoke, getting paid $12 a month, to ask him to help find him a job in Boston. And my grandfather went out of his way to help him get a job in Boston for his son, Rabbi Yeshebeh, which got more than $12 a month. Um, but he remained in, in Holyoke. How did he deal with his level of Torah knowledge? So I guess... A, uh, a a tzibur, a congregation that might not necessarily been on on his level. How did he contend with that? And I also, you would once mention to me that if he would get into an altercation, he would never get into a an ad hominem attack. It would always be there. They respected him for the way he treated other people, even in the midst of a of a heated disagreement. He had he went to the public debate with an atheist, and the shul was scheduled. And the atheist was like astounded that not one adjective came out of his mouth in, in the dueling of, of minds. Not one adjective came out of his mouth. He said that that's a stupid thought. That's that's a crazy idea. But he never ever said about the person. Oh, what kind of what are you what are you dumb? What are you, he never ever used not, not not the contemporary style of of dealing with the, the disparate opinions. You know what I mean? It was very much different than that. And um, he, so what he did to do with with his frustration of absence of Torah, he had Rav Hamnik who lives in who lived in Farakway, I think. Um, he had uh, Rolio Ramnik, Rolio Ramnik, who was a good Godel. My, my, my grandfather revered him, gave him smicha. Rav Yaakov Weinberg, that Sal, was Shiva of Ner Yisrael, used to come. And I got smicha from my grandfather. He once told me, I was driving a taxi with him in Ocean Parkway, he told me it was frightening to go. He said, literally, people would, like, release, what kind of releases they would have in their body. He was so gentle, actually. And also, um, he had also, of course, Rav Gifta came regularly. Rav Gifta was a Rav of Waterbury then, and he came regularly to see my grandfather and take a talk and learning. And most of the Jewish Rav Gifta printed were from my grandfather to him. It was, um, he was something out of, out of this extraordinary in terms of his anova humility. He hated covid. What do I learn from him? I hope to learn from him still. I, I just, I met a lady, Mrs. Rabunwich, Older woman, my wife and I both met her because she was she knew my grandfather. She was, we, we visited Holyoke. I lectured one time in Holyoke. The remaining whatever remaining Jews there were in Holyoke, and he, um, Mr. Rubin, told me the following. I verified the story through the son. She had a son. He has a son that was about to get bar mitzvah, and this son, his grandfather, passed away. My grandfather passed away, so he was very broken. 
the mitzvah boy is getting by mitzvah in two weeks was broken. So Reb Leifara, the guy in Reb Leifara went over to him and said, Shabbos of a mitzvah, I'm your grandfather. It sounds very poetic. It sounds very calming and soothing. Wow, the Rav, those days the rabbi, told me he's my grandfather for Shabbos. Comes Friday night, rabbi's sitting up front, boy has a new pair of shoes, my grandfather went over to him, said, well, nice pair of shoes, you know, treating him like very contemporary, you know, not being his mind stuck in a Tosus or a Rajba or a Tobolic passage. Shabbos morning, they can't find my grandfather in shul. Finally, there's a man with towels covered his head. He's sitting in the middle of the shul. Next to him is the Bar Mitzvah boy. So he said, Rav, oh, I'm his grandfather. I sit next to my grandson on Shabbos. He, he meant what he said. The emiskite of his midas was like so profound. I'm the grandfather. I can't sit in the front of him. My grandson's sitting here. I sit with him in the Mitzvah. What does it mean to be? Then there was Mrs. R- another person. Mrs. Bumish tells me a story. Told us that she's not she's, she, she passed away. She was 90 when I first saw her many years ago. My wife and I met her in her, in her home. She tells us a story where there was a family from Slabotka that just came back from the ravages of the war. Survived. I'll end with this story because it's really a meaningful story. And I want you really, you know, we should both take this into our hearts. There was... Um, the ravages of the war, they came, they came by, and they got married in Holyoke. And my grandfather was a Masadic Kedushin. They looked around, and there was, the Chasaka looked around. They saw nobody. No family, no parents were killed. Brothers, sisters, nobody. They started crying. Now, the reflex reaction of a Rav is to say, Bracha, David, everything will be fine. It's a Shem. Things will be good. My grandfather did not do that. My grandfather said, Kindalach, my dear children, cry, cry, and cry. These tears will bring you endless nachas. That's what I learned from my grandfather. Rabbi thank you for sharing us the, the, the beautiful recollections of your grandfather, Zechazal Brachot. Blade for Zekasanik Lebrocha. Thank you very much. Thank you.